Hello. So today we're going to lead off by bringing up a situation that happens frequently. Suppose we have a filter and it's filtered some signal and we would like to undo that filter's effects. So if we look at this in the frequency domain, this is fairly straightforward. Let me lay out the situation here. So we have x, it's input into some filter h. We get out a y. We would like to take that y and put it into another filter h i for the i for inverse and get out x hat, which we would like this to be equal to x. Like so. Well, in the frequency domain, this becomes pretty straightforward. We have y e to the j omega is equal to x e to the j omega times h e to the j omega. Therefore, x hat of e to the j omega will be x e to the j omega h and h i. All we need is for this to be equal to 1. Can we do it? Well, sure. So if h e to the j omega, uh, and I'm going to start putting this in terms of uh, the z transform just for ease, is equal to some polynomial in um, z in the numerator and some polynomial in the denominator. We'll call this uh, b of z and this would be a of z. Then we just let h i of z be a of z over b of z and we're done. We can perfectly invert a system. It gets even better. There are fairly good ways of estimating what the transfer function is uh, if you're given data that we can use in real life. But we have a problem. What's that problem? Well, in order for a system to be stable, uh, we must have all poles inside the unit circle. The problem comes in that there is no such requirement on A. I'm sorry, for B. Thus, when we go to find the inverse, this may now have roots outside the unit circle. If that's the case, then h of z is not invertible. OK, so let's kind of run through some examples. Because really, if we have all the roots in h of z are canceled by all the roots in h i. It doesn't really matter where they are. There's one way to think about it because they're gone. Something that may blow up is going to be um, squashed by the other side and, and vice versa. And so theoretically h followed by h i we're safe. There's no problem whatsoever. We should be able to perfectly invert something. Let me point out two problems with that in practice. The first problem we have already talked about a little bit in a previous lecture, and that's quantization. So if we were to come back to our system up above and add some quantization noise here, 
This could uh, prevent a real problem. So this is why. First off, it's not like we go around and say, let's add quantization noise here, there, and everywhere. It's the fact that as we calculate the output of our first filter, there will be some rounding to whatever our, our precision is. So even if we have double precision and floating point values, when we perform the filtering and we add values together, we're going to get more significant bits than we can hold in our double precision float. And so we round or uh, truncate the extra bits. This shows up as noise, as we saw in our quantization lectures. This noise is going to be white, or approximately white. And so we'll have a white noise signal going into this HI. HI will now have some roots outside the unit circle, which if those roots are excited with any signal whatsoever, they're going to blow up. So even though this noise may be imperceptible, all it takes is one bit someplace to be rounded and this filter HI will go unstable. Incidentally, we, uh, we had a case where we were actually developing a system and it had a problem like this and it was very, very subtle because it should have been fine. All instability should have been canceled and the growth of this filter as it went unstable was very slow because it was similar to what I described where just one very insignificant bit would eventually grow and so it would run fine for about a minute and then it would blow up and we're trying to figure out where this came from so anytime you have a root outside the unit circle or something um, even though you think you're perfectly canceling it with a zero from a cascaded filter, you will have problems. So, because of that, uh, we can't even temporarily throw in this extra filter to cancel it that has the root, uh, has a root outside the unit circle. Another problem comes this way. What happens if h of z has a zero on the unit circle. If h of z has a zero on the unit circle, then it will kill certain frequencies, whatever that, wherever that zero or those zeros are. It will be the job of hi to bring those filters back. So what does that look like? Well, we multiplied it by zero to make it go away, and now hi is going to have to multiply it by infinity to make it come back. Unfortunately, even if we could multiply it by infinity, it's gone. There's no getting it back. So we actually, uh, having this idea of an invertible filter seems to have some restrictions to it, and we'll address those. So, what class of signals can we invert? Well, minimum phase filters are filters that have all poles and all zeros inside the unit circle. So a minimum phase filter is invertible. Note, we can't even have uh, zeros on the unit circle. They have to be inside. One other thing that I might add, and I probably should have done it earlier, and that is up here where we want h times hi to be equal to 1, Sometimes it's possible to relax that requirement and say that uh, or it's equal to some pure delay. And this is so that we could have sensibly a purely um, causal H and H inverse. If we didn't have uh, that relaxation, then the inverse would necessarily be uh, non-causal in some cases and so that's another option that we have available to us so let's uh, see how we can use this idea of a minimum phase filter to uh, invert other systems 
So we would like our filters to look, for example, like the one over here on the left. In one phase, everything is inside the unit circle. What happens then if we have something that is not minimum phase? In this case, we need a way to come up with a minimum phase approximation to that filter. So, suppose we had this simple filter here. It's causal so that we have two poles inside the unit circle and we also have two zeros outside the unit circle and this will be our H as to H of Z. So in order to, to invert this filter we would need to, let me copy this, we need to define H inverse to have a pole there, a pole there, a zero there, and a zero there, which will be unstable. However, we know that if we had a pole right here instead, and right here that would have the same impact on the magnitude we saw this with our all pass filters now you see why we discussed them first so what we need to do is come up with a filter that will be stable and will have um, as close to an inverse as possible so what we'll do is we start by saying that uh, H inverse, and I'll leave it red because it's unstable, is equal to um, let's see, we'd have 1 minus A Z to the minus 1 times 1 minus A conjugate z to the minus 1. So those are the two poles. I'm sorry, that needs to be on top. Like so. And that is for that being A and this being A conjugate. Now we also have out here, we have a B and a B conjugate for original H. And so H inverse is going to have 1 minus B, 0 to the minus 1 to ca cancel the 0, and 1 minus B conjugate, 0 to the minus 1, to cancel the other 0. But we know that. Uh, this is going to lead to something unstable. So let's come up with another filter. We'll call H I hat of Z. It's going to equal H I of Z times H all pass of Z. And it's not just a general one, it's a very specific one. And this all pass filter is going to have a pole right where that black one is and a zero outside so let me show this like so okay so now we have poles at 1 over B and we have zeros at B our scaling factor out front will be 1 over B B star so we could multiply the B and the B star throughout that and get back to our canonical form for uh, an all-pass filter. Okay, so it's important to make the distinction here. We are coming up with an H inverse. We're not actually applying, our H inverse hat, rather. 
we're not actually applying H inverse and then applying H all pass. Because in order to do so, we would have to have uh, a pull outside the unit circle. But rather, we are using these two concepts, putting them together, and combining the filters before we actually implement it. And that will give us H hat inverse. So this is our approximate inverse. is equal to 1 minus A z to the negative 1. It's 1 minus a star z to the negative 1 on the top. And on the bottom, instead of having 1 minus b, we're going to have b minus z to the negative 1 and b star minus z to the negative 1. So the product of uh, h all pass and our ideal uh, but unimplementable inverse filter gives us this. So now we have a filter that will invert the magnitude response. Unfortunately, it can't do anything for the phase response, or it'll do something, but phase response won't be quite right. So there we are with our using an all-pass filter to get an approximate um, inverse, where in other situations, we actually wouldn't be able to have an inverse. So if we finish this up by marking up this filter here, if we started with h of z and we wanted to invert it with h of i, h of i is going to throw a 0 here and a 0 here, so those will cancel. It can't cancel that zero out there, but it can put a pull here and a pull there. And so the result is we're left with a single all pass filter. So h e to the j omega times h hat inverse e to the j omega is equal to h all pass e to the j omega. Um, I should, I guess, make a distinction here. That all pass filter. It's separate, different from the one above in that it's one over that one, but it's still an all pass filter. So that's how we use all pass filters and move poles around to actually take a non-minimum phase filter and find an inverse. And once again, if it's a minimum phase filter, uh, that's not necessary.